Sefer al-Baqarah. That's chapter 2, if you go by the numbers like I do. You find in verse 255 the important statement about God when he describes himself. He says, A'udhu billahi min shaitani rajim Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayu kayyum La ta'khudhu sinatun wa la naum Lahu ma fit samawati wa ma fil art Mandala di yashfu'u indahu ila bidni Yadamu ma bayna aidihim wa ma khafuhum Wa la yuhitun bi shay'in min ilmihi illa bimisha Wasiya kursiyuhu samawati wal art Wa la ya uruhu hiftahuma Wa hul aliyul adhim those of you who know the Arabiya, the Arabic of this, have already some kind of a comprehension of what we're talking about. In order to bring it to the English language, I'm going to use several of the different translations and bring it in a way that I hope, inshallah, God willing, will make us understand better. First, Allah begins in the negative, saying what He is not. Allah, He is the one. There is none other to worship except for Him. Then He says that He is alive, al hay. He says He is self-subsisting. In other words, He doesn't need anything to take care of Him, <laughs> but He's the one who takes care of everything. He says that He doesn't need to rest, and He doesn't need any sleep. Then He continues by telling us that everything in the heavens and the earth belong to Him. The earth and all that it contains, all the universe, belongs to him. He then asks us the rhetorical question, meaning he doesn't want you to answer it. Obviously, you know. He says, who is there that could make intercession between Allah and his creation, except that Allah has to give them permission to do it in the first place? It's a good question, isn't it? Then he goes on to talk to us about our knowledge. He says that his knowledge is all comprehensive of all that exists in the past, in the front, above, below. Total comprehension of all knowledge at all times. Well, our knowledge, he says, is what? Limited to what? What he gives us. We have no knowledge except the knowledge that he wills for us to have. Then he talks about his kursi. He says, Wasi a kursi yuhusamawati wal arb that his cursey extends over the universe and everything in it. What is a cursey? Well, I'm sitting in a cursey. This is a cursey. This is a chair. But it also means a stool. Or it can be something in front of the throne. The throne of Allah. In Arabic, Allah's throne is his arsh. Some commentators or translators have mistakenly called this the verse of the throne because of the reference to this cursey. But in fact, this is not the arsh or throne of Allah. This is what's known as his stool or uh, what sits in front of his arsh or throne. But the way that he defines it here by saying that it extends over the whole universe is an amazing statement. At the time of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, some of the companions asked about this subject. They said, "Is the cursey of Allah the same as His throne?" And he told them, "No, that." He said, "This cursey compares in size to Allah's throne, the same way that if you had a ring, you know, a ring from your finger, and you threw it out into the desert. Now, what would be the comparison of a small ring compared?" to the expanse of the desert. Well, I think we can all figure out pretty fast. It's an amazing comprehension here, an amazing comparison when we talk about the size of a ring compared to the size of the desert. One of the sub-commentators about this says that likewise, Allah's creation of all the universe pales in comparison to the size of the cursey because it is like a ring thrown in the desert. I like to just sum that thought up like this. We as human beings have a tendency to think of ourselves as being pretty big. We compare ourselves to other things around us. Insects, animals, and other creation of a law. But then think about ourselves compared to a mountain. Or comparing ourselves to the moon. The moon is huge. And if you compare the moon to the size of the sun, 
the sun is bigger. And if you compare the size of the sun to the size of the galaxy, or the galaxy compared to the Milky Way, or the Milky Way when it's compared to the size of this total universe. And then, when we talk about the size of the universe compared to Allah's kursi, it's small, it's so tiny, tiny compared to Allah's kursi. But the kursi is tiny, tiny compared to Allah's arsh. And now watch how Allah ends the verse. It's so impressive. And he's saying that he never gets tired of preserving it, this universe. And he is what? He is so high and so big and so above and majestic above all things. Now this is the description of Allah that he gives to himself. There's nothing in the universe that could ever begin to compare to Allah. From the things that we've learned from Allah in this verse, it now makes common sense to us to realize that nothing in the creation could ever compare to Allah. Allah also uses another beautiful verse in the Quran when He says, "Laysa kamithlihi shayin, wa huwa semiun basir." He's telling us that there is nothing that compares to Allah anywhere, any place, any time. With this understanding of who Allah is in the Qur'an, in Islam, it then becomes easier for us to understand the relationship between God and the Prophet Jesus, peace and blessing be upon him. This will really help us, again, to clear this fog of misunderstanding. Because Jesus, peace and blessing be upon him, was a human being. He was born even though by miracle birth, but he was born. Naturally, he needed to nurse, just like any baby would nurse. He would need to learn how to walk. And God has all knowledge, whereas Jesus didn't. He would need to learn how to eat. He would need to learn how to, to uh, take care of all of his needs and necessity through life. So as Jesus has needs, he is a creation. Whereas God, Allah, has no needs, totally samad. This means to us as Muslims, Jesus is not God. Jesus is not a son of a God, nor is he a partner or an associate with God in any way. Now, as we've talked about already, there are those who would say, well, wait a minute, my religion teaches this, or I've heard this, I've understood that. Yet, what makes the most important impact on us here is, what does common sense tell us? If we believe in God as being perfect, without any shortcomings, and is not like his creation, then how could we ascribe these kind of characteristics to the creation or vice versa? Let's consider this as well. In Islam, all of the prophets of God, and we're talking about, in this case, Adam, Abraham, Noah, Job, Moses, David, Solomon, all of the prophets are very high, having a very high status, elevated very big. This is not something small for us. As Muslims, we understand these prophets are more than just human beings in that they're the epitome of the best character and behavior. They're the ones selected by God chosen by God, created by God, to be the representatives of a message. Not a partner with God, though, but a message from God to us. What is the message? The message is to worship God, to worship Him alone, without any partners. La ilaha illallah. This same message is coming with every one of those prophets. Because they are the ones selected for that, they have to have the highest character, be in the best standing, Someone we could look up to and emulate in their characteristics. When we have this concept of who these prophets are, then we can better understand the message that they're delivering to us. In the Arabic language, they're actually called messengers of God. Rasul means one who carries the arsalla, or the message. And the message is simple. To believe there really is God, and then to worship him as he should be rightfully worshipped. 
It is up to God and God alone to tell us what worship is. It's up to Him to deliver the message to us through whomever He chooses. The important status of Jesus or Isa salam in Islam is that he fulfills all of the prophecies mentioned about him in the Old Testament and he fulfills the prophecies about what will come and then what will happen after he's here and then when he returns so we understand Jesus as being the Messiah that he is the one chosen he is the one who will be the miracle birth born of the virgin he will come and he will do miracles which he did exactly according to us we understand that he had miracles associated with him such as curing the sick healing the lame giving sight to the blind and even restoring life to a person who had died this is mentioned in the Quran and it's referenced in the New Testament as well at the same time though we as Muslims understand that it was God who did this and then it was Jesus who attributed all of these miracles to God alone. That he was the one showing us the miracles and at the same time insisting that we should worship God without any partners. Again, lifting this fog, removing the misconceptions about the Jesus of Islam. He is a mighty messenger of Allah, but not a partner with Allah and certainly is not Allah. We hope in our program that this has removed some of that fog of misunderstanding. We hope you'll visit more of our programs and watch and share together with us in this. Until next time, this is Yusuf Estes reminding you it's Allah who guides. May Allah guide us all. Ameen.